been these Americans. They've taken their own experiences and others to produce and communicate who they are and who we are as people. You have a filmmaker, a writer, performer, um, activist. You have a director, editor, writer, and like all of these things combined. So, so I mean, this is a great opportunity for you to ask questions about how they've gotten to where they are. What are they doing now? Like, Anything else you can further your career, like anything at all, this is your opportunity to get to know them and their network. So, does anyone have any questions? Um, what, have, what have you done? Has, like, what have you seen as your big, biggest obstacle? So, a lot of these industries are not dominantly Asian, obviously. And so, what would you say to you? Um, I think that um, naturally I'll just, I'll just tell you a little bit about how I started out and um, I write a lot of, of a, lo a lot about topics that concern feminism and concern love and concern everything but from a, an Asian American woman point of view and I didn't always do this because when I first started out um, I looked a lot for male characters and I just thought that no one's going to be interested in, you know, listening to a woman's point of view, especially uh, an ethnic uh, woman point of view. And I didn't want to be called a lot of those things that great woman writers are called, you know, clever, witty, but in fact, skull. You know, because what, a lot of times, I, if you uh, look in the high society of writing, I think in 2002 to 2003, 80% of the New Yorkers' body lines were still men. And although we've come a lot further from where we were in the 60s, that's still a very small percentage of women voices in the media, 20%. I know there's not 20% of us living out there, so there should be 20% of us speaking up or writing. Um, and, you know, I tried to write, I wanted to write about jungles and safaris and all those things and, you know, the American story that, that male white writers write about. Except, I didn't know anything about jungles. And, I mean, I had only been here for a couple of years and safari was still kind of like an SAT word. So I didn't, <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about these topics and yet I wanted to write these stories. And, and I, until one day, I found a translation of a great woman poet from the 18th century uh, called Ho Sun Moon. And um, I would say that she was the first published uh, Vietnamese feminist because she wrote in such a liberating voice and she was an incredible revolutionary. And people read her. And uh, her work is still around. And her work, when I found, was translated by John Malaman, who was uh, a professor, but a white male professor. And I thought, that's kind of weird. This is more my story than his story. So why is he translating this poetry? Why shouldn't I be translating this poetry? So that's what I went out and do. And uh, that's when I started telling my story, because I didn't want someone else to tell that story for me. Um, and I think that. To answer your question, I'm sorry, it's kind of a long-winded um, answer, but to answer your question, the biggest obstacle is when you choose what you want to write about, you can't let people dictate it, and you can't do too much internal dialogue where you tell yourself, this is what they want to hear. What do you want to tell? What, what appeals to you? What, you know, what do you go to sleep thinking about that you wouldn't be able to get to another day if you didn't tell it.
đó cũng muốn xin nhắn tại sao không làm cái cái chương trình về mình để tìm hiểu thêm về mình bản năng mình tức là cái cái sự cố gắng của người Việt Nam mình ở đây tại Hà Nội bắt đầu đó cũng làm cái chương trình phòng về thư viện có nửa tiếng thôi nói về cái cuộc hành trình the journey of my của của từ Việt Nam qua Mỹ ra sao cái đó là có có thể cái đó cũng là điều khó để cho một lần nhưng mà khi mà mình làm được rồi là mình rất là thành viên tại vì có thể cho mọi người biết là mình từ đâu đến và nước Việt Nam mình ra sao cái Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wish my movies was a lot better than that. I think that's how I this um, But the thing is, this whole idea of like finding your own voice, and that's sort of like the reason why I made my short film, um, I know, and the reason why I sort of like making the film, because I think that the, the hardest obstacle is people's ignorance, or, or uh, what people have, have been taught as history. You know, we're fighting against history. We're fighting against the lack of history. When I was trying to research um, Journey from the Bomb, you can't go to a section in the library and look up old people unless it's like East Asian Library Archive, you know? <laughs> or specifically looking at specific things. And, and I had to go to the bookstore from like Little Saigon and try to find any books that, because my opinion my is you know, it's taking two years to read one book. Um, So I had to find English translations, and so I had to find those books. I mean, there was a, there was a book about, about a woman who went to visit her husband in the education camp. There was a book written uh, by uh, a postman, but he, you know, he spent six years in the education camp. So those little things I had to go back to our community to try to try and find, because it just didn't exist. Like you can't find pictures of both people. You can't find pictures of the education camp. You really have to talk to people. And this is the kind of, but this is the history where nobody wants to talk about. And if they die, we take that history with them. You know? And for us, as, as the younger generation, I think that it's, I think it will help us to find out who we are if we find out who they are, you know, our parents' generation. So um, my voice is sort of, you know, comes from trying to understand my own language, you know, and trying to understand um, my parents' language.
until after college, I, I joined. I went to see a performance by Club Noodles, Laughter from the Children of Mormons, and it was about getting to marry them, man. Just like all those issues, you know, like what about you know, and then learning English and you know, being ashamed of your family and all that stuff. And I just went, ah, oh, that's me. I was like that. <laughs> and uh, so I joined them, and for a year, I, I learned, you know, what it felt like to have. Vietnamese friends speaking Vietnamese, you know, joking. It's a very different, unique way, you know. Um, so then, and then I joined, and then I got into film school and then we made short films, and that's how I got here. And you, you make contacts along the way, you meet artists that you want to work with, like, like, oh, like a really cool guy you work with in the day. And uh, I was trying to encourage to translate with some issues, so it is easy. Because I heard her poetry. So kind of going off of what you said that you wanted to apply to and whatnot, you know, I'm not trying to stray into, I'm not trying to generalize, but um, for most, I guess, traditional Vietnamese families, they try to push their kids, you know, our generation, into going to be like doctors and engineers. So I was wondering, you know, did you guys face that kind of resistance? And if so, how did you handle it? And, you know, like, so what do you guys do? I've been like, you know, here, you know, um, I believe you do documentaries, you do film, you know, poetry. Like, how do you guys have a price on the table? You know, you know, you're paying the bills. <laughs> so what keeps you going, basically? That's what I'm kind of trying to ask. And how did you overcome Đương nhiên là qua tại Việt Nam mình luôn luôn cứ muốn mình là vô cái ngành nào mà có thể có tiếng hoặc là có tiền, tiếng có tiền. Tại cả gia đình của ba mẹ cái sang cái first generation của Việt Nam mình là luôn luôn thất bại. Nhưng mà mình là second generation, mình ở Mỹ, mình biết được Việt Nam, mình biết được Mỹ, thì mình chọn cái gì mà mình thích là mình làm. Như vũ vũ cũng chọn cái 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 phim ba mẹ vũ về hồn hồn họ trẻ, ba mẹ cũng rất là ghét. <cười> nhưng mà vũ thích là chịu tâm ba mẹ cũng đâu có làm gì được <cười> I, 
last year I got this um, the Rockefeller grant, which gave me to live on for a year. And then this year I just got two, I just received these for two more grants um, on Thursday. So um, that's you know, but then that money I have to use a lot to help make this happen. So um, we do what we can. Um, but I think that that. You know, I don't look down on any jobs. Somebody that I need to shoot for much more job. Somebody needs to edit something. Okay, I'll do it. You know, because I think that it's still I'm sharpening my my tools. And it's just like in your field, whatever it is close to, it will help you continue to, to grow in the art form that you do. Um, yeah. Can I ask So I come across a lot of grants for community work, for public service, for uh, creative art that um, it just needs a little bit of work on your behalf, but I assure you that it's worth it. And it, it feels really rewarding because someone is paying you to do what you love. And that's fair because if you wanted to be a doctor and you love doing it, someone's paying you for it. So why should someone pay you when you're writing or making and it's, it's it's good for us. Then the thing, the good thing is that they'll they'll follow you. Like the Rockefeller grant that I got last year, um, after I received it, they gave me the nomination for people. You know, so now I'm the nominee. And I'm like, okay, the next one is going to be this guy. You know, I'm going to like throw his name in the hat to to try and get some funding to do what he's doing. Because I just think that it's, you know you got to pass that karma down. And and the good thing about these these organizations, once you get an award, you part of, of their family to get and become part of the you have a group of people that continue to support the work. Um, another word I got was called this is Grace on um, Jesus Grace Award. And um, it's a foundation it's like you know you get some new friends and uh, but they've been following me and every time like I need something I need nothing and they go down. So they're great resources so you don't you don't have to be alone with the mother at all. And and I really encourage Artists talking to each other. I was just in um, in Paris. And I met I met, I met uh, Oh yeah, she was. Yeah, I had I had coffee with her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys, did you, anybody here know Yuko's work? No way. She she wrote Paradise of the Blind. I don't know the name of this person. Uh. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Novel without a name. Memories of a Pure Spring. The new one just came out. But I was talking to him, and I was like, you know, well, what is, you know, like, Hemingway, when he was writing, he had this group of expats, you know, they were talking to each other, right? The beatniks had their own groups. And I'm looking, and I'm like, well, and I'm glad whenever I come to these conferences that I see, like, the musicians, the Vietnamese American musicians hanging out and jamming together. It's great, you know? And, and that's what I was hoping for, and I asked her, you know, what is, what is that like in Vietnam? And she goes, well, I don't know. Because I didn't, like, she, you know, the government is always harassing her. Mm -hmm. They put her in jail all the time. So nobody wants to go there. Nobody wants to be taken, you know, be in a photograph with her because they get in trouble. The government can come after them. And so there, there is a, a, a very big sense of community, you know. And I think that that's so important. Like, you're not just one voice, you are a chorus. You know, and that's what makes us strong. And, and the more you can harmonize with other parties, you know, the, the, the better it is, the stronger it's going to make your, your work. Um, so that's, that's what I also want to do with you guys, too. I think that, sorry, um, we can go on to the next question. Yeah, I just want to respond with what you're saying. You're saying, like, how should you approach dealing with, with your parental expectations, all right? It's like, I guess, like, a, when I was going through MIT, you know, the expectation for me was to you know, study hard in engineering, to learn math and stuff. But I guess like in the modern day, high school and college, um, it's, it's become clear that being academic isn't good enough anymore. And so the temporary solution I guess you can give your parents is that, you know, by doing the things in arts and community-related work, 
that it creates a more robot rather than individual. Those are the kinds of things that get you in colleges and better jobs and such. So if you tell them that's your piece at the moment, then you can do what you want on the side of the arts. And we live in a very unique situation that's different from our parents' generation because you know, they didn't really have choices. You know, it, it's hard in a different respect. Now, it's like they have too many choices. And during college, you know, just like you know, Hannah was saying, um, you, take, you take as much time as you can to try to find you know, communities that you can go around. You know, those little things that you always wanted to do. You know, like when I was in high school, I would you know, study math, study science, um, and I'd be you know, drawing in secret. You know, my parents walk down the hallway and switch the art book the math book. You know? But uh, in college, you know, uh, you get to start doing whatever you want. I started singing, I started you know, meeting people, doing getting new, new stuff, stuff I'd never done before. Because in high school, I was under you know, the dictatorship of the Asian parent. <laughs> when you're in college, like, you should take full advantage of all the different kinds of opportunities you can because Especially once you leave the college environment, it's very difficult to, to find communities when you're stuck in your 9-to-5 job. So finding, if it's in arts, if it's, if it's in research, whatever it is, finding what you like and building upon that, while trying to take care of the, the basics of your your parents, it's a hard thing to juggle, but if you can try to keep in mind, you know, developing stuff on the side, like kind of calls like stupid little things, those stupid little things develop into careers, like, you know, Grammy-nominated stuff. It may seem stupid at the beginning to you and your parents, but you know you have to make a more concerted effort because we have these expectations of parents. That's really the only way you can you can explore um, different opportunities besides doctors and engineers and lawyers. Um, conferences like this meet other people who also do arts, or other people who you know do uh, stuff in media, and uh, people who manage. There's no role map for any of this stuff, especially. <laughs> also, I wanted to encourage you guys to do what you want to do, although it might not be the traditional road, also because you guys can afford to, you know, because you live here. And yes, there's many things that are wrong with this country and maybe this administration. Um, <laughs> but I won't get into that. Um, but, you know, I have. Uh, a lot of my writers' friends from Vietnam, for example, I know this group, their name is Bang Mi, Open Mouth Poet. And they're an underground uh, poet group, and all that the writing is published is through photocopies. It's so all underground, the government has no control of it. Because although you know they claim that you can write about anything you can, that you want to over there, you can't if you don't write about politics. So how free is your writing if you don't have the freedom to think? So here, you have a lot of freedom to think, and you have a lot of freedom of expression. It may not be everything, but it's a lot better than other places. And your co-artists in Vietnam are always looking to you for your voices. You know, they're always wondering what we are doing over here. You know, what are we doing in the diaspora? They want to listen to what we have to say. You know, they ask me all the time, what, how are we going to read these upcoming generations and they don't tell us what is going on there and they want to know because we have the freedom to say what, what is in our mind. One question I have to read in your poetry is that you mentioned that um, I was wondering what you read about in the history, read about politics or um, being involved with Vietnam and like I want to, but I, I just don't want to be hated on by my own country. Mm -hmm. I know it's just the system. Uh, um, that's a really good question, and thank you for asking it. Um, I think I've written about art in the past, and, and me just saying that when you don't have the freedom to think is in a published interview uh, that was published last year. And it does make me worry. I haven't been back to Vietnam since that was published. Um, and I have heard, you know, stories, and I, I don't think that there's a lot of prosecution as far as if your writing is, is published. Uh, but it, it, it's something, it's a choice that you wrestle with, you know, and um, I think 
that uh, it's good for you to communicate with buyers there. It's good for you to communicate, hey, how is the government treating you? Um, I have a friend of mine, his name is uh, Jen Do, who used to be the editor for Hong um, He, When he went back to Vietnam, there were some harassment. They didn't quite imprison him, but they did ask him to come to the you know, police office perhaps every day or every other day. And when you're on vacation, it's, you, know, you don't want to come report uh, every day or every other day. So I don't have any happy answer for that question for you uh, because it has to be honest. And I think the honest truth is that there is no easy answer to that. But as for myself, I have made the choice to say what I really want to say. Yeah. I want to sort of comment on that too. Because you're right. It's, it's a scary thing. You know, I, I, I've seen people protest, you know, the play. Um, <laughs> and if you say something bad over here, you say anything that sounds like you're sympathizing, and they will protest you. And, I, you know, this issue came up when I was making, like, my go, because in the film, I was following any for you guys. One brother kills the other brother, right? Because it's a film about the Vietnam War. And it's like, and, and one brother has to regret it for the rest of his life. So the question is, who kills who? The North or the South? Because who's your audience and how are they going to interpret your film? If I put the, the Northern brother and he kills the Southern brother and he regrets for the rest of his life, am I saying the communist has to regret? Or if the Southern brother kills the Northern brother, does that mean that our government you know, over here you know, should think about their, their brothers in Vietnam? And, you know, how, how is the community here going to be? It? How's the community there going to be? And it's just one of those things where you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And the, the main point is I had to take all that and just throw it out of my head and go, that's not what the film is about. That's not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is it's a message about healing. I don't care if you're shot. I don't care if you're I don't care if you're responsible. I don't care if you're guilty. All I care is that there is a fracture, that there's a wound, you know? And I wanted to tell a story about them, this family, and this community. And so it really has to do with like, you know, you have you make that choice, like what I'm gonna say. But it's just like how bad do you really want to say it? And if you really want to say that bad, you let the chips fall and everything. And people will interpret it, your words in any way they want anyway. So you have no control. Once it's out there, you do public work, and that's the, that's the difficulty of being an artist because your works are public. You know? You know, you, you go and you do your program, yeah, a lot of people but in terms of like, you know, when you're an artist, you put yourself out there. That means every word you say, people can write down and show you around. And the thing is that that means you just have to know why you're saying it all the more. You know, because that way, that's, that's your message. Can I ask you, since you just asked that question, to read the quotes in the handout that I did out loud? Um, we live in oppressive times. We have, as a nation, become our own block seats. But instead of calling the process that we can live in our expression of dissent in one year censorship, we call it concern for commercial viability. Um, I, I just thought that I wanted to give you guys this quote because uh, when you start to make your own work, if you're, you know, Aspiring artists, a lot of times you're going to wonder, you're going to be concerned about how your message is going to be received by whoever and whatever. Uh, and this particular nation, a lot of times, is how commercial it is, how how, how much money can it make. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, don't worry about it. Just say what you want to say. Can I make a comment about what you said? It's not on the art side, but you said, you, what are you saying that? You were afraid of how people would judge it, or were you afraid of like the, how the government would treat you? Well, you know that. Um, so I the thing is like I, I do performance poetry and I get really scared sometimes because um, the things that I think of I don't like going into politics, but there is one moment. Um, where I wrote about Stan T. Williams. Do you guys know who Stan T. Williams is? He, uh, he 
was a, like she was on that row and um, was, like, he didn't plead guilty, but they, they prosecuted him for uh, being a crip member and uh, doing all that. And I, I didn't understand why he was being killed because not all the evidence were there and I performed that. And I, and I got really scared, but I performed that with um, talking about how Lieutenant William Kelly, who, who, who went to Eli and killed everyone in Vietnam, or not everyone in Vietnam, in the village, but he was set free. And, and I was, I guess, looking back, um, I shouldn't have really said that Dan's killing was innocent because I didn't know. But um, when, um, after I performed it, a lot of people called me fearless. And uh, some people got, not really angry, but I sent some animosity because they they felt in the war that Stan Kilman was, uh, was really guilty. And and I didn't, I didn't want that to happen again. I could talk about Vietnam and like the kindness and um, being hated on by many people when that's not the message that I'm trying to send. I'm just trying to say that, that I don't like what's going on. Oh, I'm 
sorry. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. My bad. Sorry. Just for people who don't know who you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, welcome to the workshop, and it's all in Um, Finding our voices and basically what it's about is what Nan just said. Um, having done graduated from CLA with a master's in film and television, he won Best Short Film in the, in the USA Film Festival for his short film, The Anniversary. He also just completed Journey of the Fall, which is what we're going to do in snippets from. Um, and this is Ruzan. He graduated from Min Min Minneapolis. Minneapolis College of Art and Design with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Filmmaking. And he's an independent filmmaker for the U.S. as well for the um. the, the purpose that like, I wanted to make this film was that because in the last 30 years, you know, nobody has made a film about this. You know, you haven't heard about boat people. Um, very few. There was one film in the 80s. Um, it's a Chinese, like a Hong Kong film. And then last year there was a Beautiful Country. Did anybody go see that? What did you guys think? You know? But it was made by a Dutch uh, film director. And so there are a lot of certain kinds of details that have sort of like been left out, you know? And I thought that for me it was important for us to tell our story from our point of view. And, um, and in that process of making this film, I wanted to stay true to that. And so um, there are certain scenes like the way that it, it started out, out with uh, the research. And so we talked to, you know, we talked to re-education camp survivors. We talked to a lot of old people. Um, and basically, it was just our neighbors and family, right? Because anybody you talk to, I mean, they they gone through that kind of experience. And so for me, in that writing, you know, I always. You know, when I'm talking to them, I ask them, is it okay if, we could, if I can use this part of the film? Because that all builds into the detail that will, that will show, um, lend the, the genuineness to, to the film. So, um, there are certain scenes, I'm going to show you guys clips of this, and, I can, and then I wanted to tell you guys, like, where that came from, you know, um, in the film. process is not your typical people show up and we give them a script and we say hey read this line you know the audition process was we saw like about over 400 people in a week and a half and we auditioned in Orange County and then in San Jose and basically every, anybody that came in they had half an hour and we just sat them down and if you like they're like what was the age then we say you know um, how did you come over to America when did you come over how did it feel to grow up, you know? Um, did you speak Vietnamese? Because I didn't speak Vietnamese, you know? Um, and then if they were older, we asked them, where were you on, on the day that Saigon fell? You know, and we asked them that kind of story. Um, so, you know, we just sat them down and talked to them and found out, you know, just try to understand. Because the audition process was about um, seeing if people can connect with their um, emotional experiences. Because we all carry that with us, you know, like, okay, it was, you know, a breakup, okay, you remember that, you know, and, and that has an emotional tone that you go to all the time, you know, and whether people can go back to that. Because a lot of times, you know, we, there was one woman I, I spoke with, and it was, you know, talking to her through a traumatic event that happened. And she went back there, and she was just describing stuff. And then she snapped out of it. She's like, what's going on here? You know, like, oh my god, like, what? And, and she was already back in that memory. And she couldn't handle it, you know? And for, for me, the audition process is trying to see if, if you can connect to your, to your experiences. You know, I don't want it to, you to go to a place where you can't come back from. Because I knew that in the film, we were going to have to do that. We we're going to have to ask people to go to painful places, you know? And, and come back. Um, I, I 
heavy metal that was going to be able to create that kind of atmosphere. And it's sort of like, again, it goes back to working with the community, working with people who have gone through that. And uh, there's a woman, her name is uh, uh, Go Kim Ji. Yeah, not Kim Ji, right? And uh, she came into the audition, and when we talked to her, she told us about her story about visiting her husband. And um, I think he was in Long uh, Kanin. Or, no, it was a camp much, much further up north. And uh, she said when she first saw him, he was like so skinny and she couldn't believe that he, you know, he's the way that he looked. And um, he basically, she told us the story and it was so powerful that I just asked her if it's okay for us to put it into the film. And so this scene, that's her story. Um, and when we were shooting, she was actually at the location. And Yumi was like very, very nervous because, you know, she's trying to portray this woman's life. You know? um, the fence and how they, you know, they're like daring, like, I dare you to cross that fence. You know, I dare you to try to escape from this thing. And I never knew about that. You know, I just wrote the first part of it. And it was so amazing, he, he finished it, and I looked at him and I was like, wow, how did you do that, you know? And, and he said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to forget if, if you hear the same speech every night for three years, you know? So he had it in him already. And that, again, it was like something that, it, you know, I could never imagine it from my generation because I wasn't there, I didn't live it, you know? But he was, and so he lent his voice to, to the, that part of the film. Um, this next one. Oh. Come on, play it. <laughs> in this part of the, of the story, I mean, I was talking to a lot of my friends, and um, details of, it's more in the film, those of you guys have seen the film, maybe you guys remember. But um, I was talking to my friend, I mean, that you met, and he had tried escaping like five times before and he gave up, and, you know. And he was only like eight at the time. And I asked him, you know, what was his most vivid memory about trying to escape? And he said, the one thing he remembers very clearly is walking to the boat at night, and it's really raining, and it's in a ditch. So they had to walk in this water. And, uh, he lost his yeah. And for some reason he just he couldn't go. He said, Yeah, but I can't go. I can't go without my sandals. I can't go without my slipper. And his mom had to try and find his his, his shoe for him. But it's kinda like those these little things that you remember that, that he shared with you and and again it's like it's something that a like, beautiful country wouldn't know to talk about because it's you know, it's, it's they're not they're not um, talking to, to the people that actually experienced it. Um, there's another thing that we that I did. I had written a, a, a scene with rain in the film. And it's a storm ballad, you know, and they're going and they hit the storm. But then when we when we budgeted it, we're like, we can't make rain. There's, you know, the rain machine, we have to take it out into the ocean and make it rain and shoot. And we're like, okay, we can't do it. Let's do it with like computer, you know, special effects. So we got this company in Toronto, and they're so excited, they're like, that's great, and then we got a storyboard artist, and sketched all these crazy shots, you know, and it was only going to be like less than one minute's worth, some sequences like 10 seconds, some sequences 30 seconds, and so this and that, sketched it out, all that stuff, they priced it, came back to this, and it was like $120,000 for one minute, they're like, okay, rain, it's gone, you know, <laughs> so then, <clears throat> while we're shooting another scene, uh, I see this dark cloud coming. It's like, you know, I was like, oh, shit. okay, hey everybody, is it okay if we do some improv? Okay, cameras, you just keep rolling, and guys, you just do what I tell you. And I'm stuck on the boat, so the boat's only like what this big, right? The length of this table, and I'm in the engine compartment, so I'm like, like ducking. They're in the front, and they're all, you know, um, and I, I didn't know though. Here it is, like, and this is the whole experience, like, well, you know, because he. he was a boat person. 
1991. I just found out today. Crazy. Um, and so I thought, okay, it's a storm. Everybody on top of the boat. When the water, when, the, when it rains, climb down inside to hide from the rain, you know, because you don't want to get wet. And uh, I had cast a, a woman uh, taking, and she said, no, no. Um, she's like, I'm sorry, can I tell you something? And I was like, well, what? She goes, that's not what we did. When you're out there on the boat and it rains, you climb up and you drink because there's no water. You know? Wow, okay, everybody, <laughs> change your mind. When it rains, you come up and you, know, you get all the dishes you can, get all the cups and collect the water and drink it and save it and all that stuff. And the, the rain came and we just shot. You know, and I'm, and I'm giving directions to, to go to Jim. And, and uh, it's so funny because the boat is all like, for the scene that Gogi Jin and, and her family has to cross from one side to the other, they were going along the side, so the boat would be like this, right? And we had a lot of people, we had like about 30 people on that boat, because I wanted to keep it real, I wanted like, when that thing comes out, I want all these people to come out, you know? And but you know the experience, his boat was like, had a hundred and something people on it, you know? And um, so the boat would go like this. So in order to keep it balanced, my producer and my production designer jumped off the boat, on the other side, was pulling it down, like <laughs> and they're trying to hide from the camera too. And so we're all trying to hide from the camera, and then the actors do their thing, and the, the boat just kept going in circles to shoot the scene. But it's just like little details like that that you know, if you don't talk to the people that know this experience, you won't have it. You know, and that's that's so important because I, I think that, and again, like when I said yesterday in the workshop, they, the older generation, don't want to talk. It's something that to them, nobody, because it's why tell my kids about it? My kids don't have to know about this, you know? But they don't understand that this affects how they raised us, you know, because of all their frustration, all of their sacrifices that they made, you know? And then, so then, if we don't go to school, and that's the reason why they want us to be lawyers and whatever, and, 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 and doctors, because then we can be rich and we don't have to worry about this, you know? And as you get, like, as I get older, I sort of, like, understand their pain now. And uh, all the things that they don't talk about. Uh, I remember, like, when, when we, I went OD, ODP, so we were sponsored. And uh, we <laughs> lived in a refugee camp in Thailand for, like, about two months. And every day, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, those who have refugee camp experience, you just stand in line and you wait to get food, right? And it's just a big, you know, and they just, you know. And, and then for, for a while it was really low. They only gave us very little food. And um, I remember one day, and, you know, the, the refugee camp, it's basically, it's in, a, it's in a house, quote unquote house, like maybe this size. But you don't have walls on these two sides. It's just the roof, this, this wall, and that wall. And everything in the middle is just poured concrete. And you have like 10, 20 families. They come and they go, this corner, okay, my family will live here. And the next family's here, the next family's here. And we just pack the house like that. And, um, and then one day I just remember, like, we really didn't have anything to do, and then, you know, we were hungry. Um, my mom came home, and she had, like, I was like, ah, cool. So she just gave it to us, and we just, it up and just eat it, you know, like chips. And, um, you know, and all the time when, when I, we were living in America, like, my, my parents never wore any wedding rings. And, like, ten years ago, I discovered that they sold their wedding rings to buy us that we bought, you know, to have money so that when we come over to America, we can, you know, we have something. Um, and that is sort of like, a, a lot of those things our parents don't tell us about. But they get so mad at us when they think that we're wasting something. You know? And for me, it's just like, you got to open that communication. you got to get them to talk. A lot of people that came and auditioned for us, they have their, my executive producer, his father was in camp for 13 years, okay? Saw some crazy things. And he came and did a two-hour interview with us, you know? And at the end of the interview, we asked him, wow, I mean, how does your family feel about this? Does, does Alan know about this? And, uh, and he goes, no, I didn't tell him, you know? I don't want to tell them about these things. It's it's shameful, you know. It's painful and shameful, and they don't need to. And 
that's the thing. But but with that, how how do we know that these things happen? How do we know that? And how do we pass that on? Because we are that generation that's gonna like we're losing that language, like you know. Bo's my hero because he, he he makes it a point to try to speak Vietnamese all the time, you know. Um, and that's kind of that's also very important. That's the culture we take with us. This next clip is just a montage of like life in America. You know, in, in this film, like coming over to America after all that, um, that part of the story is a little more sort of like based on my experiences, and I don't know how many share in that experience. But um, something interesting I want to let you guys know is this, this whole living room and this house, you know, um, this was well, this apartment. It was basically based on the apartment that my family and I grew up in when we first came over to America. So it was kind of fun to like, you know, talk to the production designer and have him sketch it out and build it. And, you know, there's like, there's a window here and then there's a, there's a clear, long window like this right next to the door. And then, you know, where we put the TV and, and, uh, and all these things. And, and um, there was, the living room was basically a big room. And so we put a curtain in the middle of it and made the other half like a bedroom. And so there's a curtain in the middle of it. You just look through and you can see the TV. So all these things that we did. And, uh, I asked my dad to come to the set. He walked in. Oh, that's incredible. That's kind of like, what is this? You know? um, but that's sort of like the fun thing about you know, like doing films. That you're able to take your own experiences and put them into the film. And I, I think last night I was talking to Bert. He's like one of the. Uh, he he was watching. You know, he remember when he was watching this film, like this kind of table. He was like, we have that kind of table. It's like fake marble. It's like all plastic, but it's like on the, on the countertop. Um, and the interesting thing is, like, there's a scene in there where the grandmother picks cans, and that's what we used to do too. Like, we used to go and go, you know, with mom. <laughs> and uh, my producer, like, he used to go with his mom too, and they, they had a big shopping cart. But um, an interesting uh, story for you guys is that there's a guy here in San Jose who owns a um, recycling company. And it all started when he came over here, and he was he went, you know, to different trash cans and picked cans. And one day, like the shopping cart became a truck, <laughs> and the truck, you know, had more people. And then the truck became a bigger truck. And now he owns like a recycling center. And he has like twenty giant, you know, recycling trucks going over and picking up. And he's like a millionaire, you know. So it's incredible, like um, how our refugee experiences, you know, change and, and how the success stories come from that. Um, so, getting back to the sort of like um, voices, you know, for me, making this film was trying to, to tell our story in our own voices so that everyone can see. So that's sort of like part one um, of this. Um, I wanted to talk about part two, but I don't want to, I don't want to take up all the time. No, we're not. Two, so please continue. <laughs> we're yeah. supposed to split our time, and I'm like eating it up. Well, the second thing is so. Something that I, I, I hope that it, all of you guys as representatives do of like um, BSA is to go back and start telling all of the members um, what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do, and I'm, I'm discovering this um, as we're trying to release this film. We can't find a distributor because when we talk to them, they love it, but they don't know what to do with it. You know, uh, uh, we talk to <coughs> Paramount, Fox Studios, Sony Picture Classics, Miramax, all those companies. They've all seen it. They really like it. They're like, but you have no stars. You have no American actors. You have, uh, it's all in Vietnamese with English subtitles. That makes you a foreign art house film. But there's no sex in your film. <laughs> there's no beautiful people, so we can't market that either. So, and it's not a sensuous, mysterious film. It's a really hard, dramatic story. And, and so right now, we're trying to, you know, we're talking to other companies. But that's the one thing, and, and we're trying to tell them, but there is a big news audience. If you look at the, the population, it's one point, in, since 2000, it's 1.3 million Vietnamese and people, you know? And right now, it's probably close to, close to like 2 million people now. And they have a, a hardcore base. I mean, and we told them about Pan we told them about Tuy Nha, 
Asia, all these videos that some of their budget goes above a million dollars and they make four a year, each company, you know? And they're able to release and sell these films. So we're like, there is an audience, but they're like, but we don't see their dollar signs on our map, you know? There, there has never been in history that shows that if there's an Asian film, Asian people will come out and see it. Because what they consider is all white people. And they said, you know, Asian, your spend, our spending pattern, like we go to the Gap, we go to Banana, we go to the Mom, and we buy all these products. And it's all, when they look at their spending pattern, we look exactly like Americans, like white Americans. So they lump us into white Americans, so there is no such thing as an Asian audience. So what I'm trying to do now is like, we're trying to change that, you know, and we, so far in the distribution, we now are talking to three companies. And part of that deal is based on the fact that, that we show them like the numbers what we have for Asia and we're like, look, uh, because we talked to this one company and they said to us, well, we, we have a, an exclusive contract with a very big video distribution company. It's the biggest one. It's universal, you know. And, um, but, you know, they require you to at least sell 40,000 copies of the film. And I just, I was like la laughing at them. Because, you know, you look at, you look at Pinya and their videos when they release it is, is 70,000 copies. You know, and on their best record, they can even go up to 80,000 to 100,000 copies that they sell. So we started creating this model for them. We're like, look, you know, and we got a to write us a letter of intent that says, look, I can guarantee you 40,000. We'll buy it from you, okay? And so that sort of like opened their eyes and they're like, wow, this is possible. You guys can actually do this? And we're like, yes, because we've done this in our community. And so because of that, like three other companies now are coming to us and talking to us. <laughs> they want a piece of that pie. They want now, you know, and the whole thing is about putting our voice down, putting our identity on that chart. Because, you know, I hope that one day there will be like, Know, Asian films and all these Asian people will go out and see it. It's just like do the right thing. And African Americans, you know, after that movie, they have a big slice on that pie because black people go out to support black movies. Why doesn't Asian people? Why don't we these people? You know. And so that's that's the first step. And I hope that you know you guys can take this back, tell all your friends, go to the website. And the the purpose is if we do get distribution in the theater, it's about the first two weekends. You know, being able to sell out the first weekend. And it's very interesting. The first, if they, if you get a smaller distribution company, you get like about five or ten theaters that they will show it in. So you start at maybe five, if you're really small, five or six. After the first weekend, if you get enough people to go see it, and you actually make a significant amount of money, the second weekend, they give you 15 to 20. And if you continue to make that, the third weekend, it's 100 prints. So you go from like showing in five, six theaters to ten theaters to a hundred theaters, you know. And I hope that one day, like, even these films can do that. Like, because people are always asking, well, how come we having such a hard time selling your film? Because I saw Bamboo and I saw, you know, Jenna's films. Okay, but Jenna Home, like, they have a distributor. It's French, and they already had all that stuff built in before they went. And you know, with Bamboo, they had Hardy Keitel, and it was all these other things. So. That was already packaged, you know, and it was catered to tell that story. Ours is different. We're trying to do something independent on our own. So the last thing I want to leave you with is something, a thought, you know, for, for um, this thing that came up when I went to Geneva. I was invited to present at EPS in Geneva. And uh, the whole, this issue about distribution came up. Like, how come we just can't book our own theater and show our own films? So it gave me the idea of creating a foundation for Vietnamese film and diaspora film, so it could be from Canada, from France, whatever. And creating this international foundation where um, we can raise money and we can book the films in the theaters for like two weeks um, in different cities in the States, and after that we tour it all over in Europe. You know? And the goal is, is like if we can get our numbers, then we don't need anybody else. We don't have to go to them and say, please draw our money, please do this for us. Because, because you know, it's, I'm tired of asking people. You know? And if, you got, if we can do that, I, I really hope to pull in like, the DSAs to come out and support all of these films. If we can get it, tell everybody. First weekend, second weekend. I think also we need to 
know about it, know about when the release dates and stuff yeah. are. So, I mean, I, I know they do have a lot of posters around the little salons and the little shops around here. So, I mean, my mom saw a flyer for the, I think it was the Green Papaya. Sense of Green Papaya. Yeah. She called the whole family out. We went to go see it because she saw the flyer. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't hear about the film. Or, I mean, I heard, I watched it before in college. But then my mom just like got the whole family to come out and watch it. So exactly. Just, I know we're, we're out of time. I just I'll leave you guys with one for that point because I was I just talked with Brooke and um, we were talking about the idea of pre-selling tickets because that will help also guarantee to these people that there's going to be an audience. And so uh, please come and visit the website and London is actually and and all of the you know, like the, the VSA group they're going to try and help us. Um, email to all of their, their listings uh, if we're going to have the screening and we try to get students to buy the ticket before it comes out so that on the first meeting we guarantee that all these people are going to go see it. So, it, you know, it's, once, it's small steps at a time, but the goal is so that we have a voice, you know, um, in Hollywood. Thank you.